At a reading at UCLA in 1950, Williams talked about how there has to be a transition from, quote, sentimental subject to the structure of a work of art. Moving from the subject of something we love and describing it, moving from the subject of something we love and describing it in rhyme verse toward a structure made of words that represents something in our lives which we recognize by the way it's made. That's the most, and then this is interesting in terms of something that you said about his kind of aggressive nationalism. So he says this transition needs to be made. It's the most important step in the culture of a nation. So I'm not going <laughs> to go there, but I am going to look at this transition um, that he was talking about. So with that in mind, I'm just going to read his poem, The Young Housewife, which was first published in 1916. At 10 AM, the young housewife moves about in negligee behind the wooden walls of her husband's house. I pass solitary in my car. Then again, she comes to the curb to call the ice man, fish man, and stands shy, uncorseted, tucking in stray ends of hair, and I compare her to a fallen leaf. The noiseless wheels of my car rush with a crackling sound over dried leaves as I bow and pass smiling. Allen Ginsberg used this poem as an illustration of Williams's alignment with Charles Reznikoff. He said, they were practicing the same poetics together, trying to get it to boil down to the direct presentation of the object that they were writing about with no excess words. And he, so he used um, the young housewife to um, prove that point. Uh, but the question I have is what is the object in this poem? A woman is metaphorically turned into a leaf and then the leaves are run over by his car. So it's a kind of murderous move unless the poem is really about its own structure, making fun of the sappy metaphorical construct woman equals leaf and pointing to its artifice. Related to Reznikov um, and his book Testimony and just thinking about documentary poetics, a couple of years ago I read a piece here um, that, I, that was called The Ring of Strategic Influence, um, which used the language from propaganda leaflets and instructions on how to make and disperse them as source texts. So here's a, an excerpt of that piece called The Nature Part. There are leaves in leaflets, updrafts and downdrafts, Follow the general direction of the wind. Constant pull of gravity, modified wing pods, detaching the fins. Winds, tides, currents, sounds projected over water, low-lying coastal plains. William Carlos Williams compares a young housewife to a fallen leaf and then runs her over. But what about the leaflet? A beehive is direct fire with steel dart flechettes. Helicopter birds in the elephant grass, my green eye sees at night, laying chilly for a mad minute. Where are the white mice this time? At 10 a.m., the young leaflet moves about in updrafts and downdrafts behind the walls of her target-rich environment. I pass solitary in my car. So again, this is associative. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> back to this move from sentimental subject to a structure made of words. And I've been, this week I've been reading over Asphodel, that greeny flower, um, which is often read as quite sentimental, a love poem, an apology to his wife for his various infidelities, a review of his life work, the thoughts of a man close to the end of his life. He finished um, this poem in 1954. Um, Herbert Leibowitz, editor of Parnassus, calls Asphodel Williams's most eloquent and unorthodox love poem, a quest for abiding love in the gathering shadows of death. And um, just as a side note, um, and because I'm interested in the fact that this panel is deliberately constituted of women only, I feel compelled to read the first paragraph of Leibowitz's introduction to this um, small New Directions copy of Asphodel goes like this. From his earliest days as a struggling poet and into old age, William Carlos Williams wrote love poems. This is not surprising, given his long career as a general practitioner and obstetrician, which kept him, <laughs> which <laughs> kept him in intimate contact with women. <laughs> 
His, <laughs> his folksy amiability and homespun demeanor made him attractive to all types and classes of women, and, <laughs> and there can be no doubt that he loved them. But they often confused him. <laughs> there was no easy access to their world. Though he was married for 50 years to his patient Griselda of a wife, Floss, reckless passion enthralled him. A glimpse of a woman's leg draped provocatively over a balcony could set him ablaze. Yet a part of his mind, wary and detached, often watched the flesh as a sober person might scrutinize a drunkard's antics. This character trait led to the singularity of Williams's love poetry. Um. <laughs> Which, um, again, associating, made me think of um, the Notley essay that people have been quoting. And there's a quotation, there's a section where she just um, quotes all of these Williams quotes. Um, and that uh, had me particularly thinking about this one description that I'll read about his reading Aspidel at Wellesley. At Wellesley once, they practically carried me off on their shoulders. I was speechless. You could hear a pin drop. A million girls were there. At least it looked that way. A bell kept ringing, it finally stopped. Floss had asked me to read the coda to Asphodel. I thought I didn't have time, but they stood on their heels and yelled, the girls, my God, I was breathless. But I said, do you really want more? And they said, yes. So I read, <laughs> I read what Floss knew they would like. They were so adorable, I could have raped them all. Um, okay, and so, <laughs> This had me thinking about um, how uh, Bob Perlman wrote uh, in a recent essay, kind of reevaluating re Williams, about how there's no way to read Williams without having certain parts of his work contradict what you think it's doing or what you want it to be doing. Um, that interpreting his work, you're often forced to ignore certain parts that don't fit. Um, which, um, again, Sarah, when you said, you know, who's the Williams I want, I, I think that's, <laughs> there are many Williamses. Marjorie Perloff has described Asphodel as, quote, a return to tradi tradition, in this case, the pastoral love poem, in which the penitent husband makes amends to his long-suffering wife. No more snatches of documentary prose, no cubist or surrealist superpositions or dislocations. The poem is stately and consistent, an autobiographical lyric in the romantic tradition. She goes on to say that it can be read as a garland for the 50s, but the Williams who speaks to the poets of our generation is, I think, less the loving apologetic husband of Asphodel or the aspiring bard of Patterson then he is a voyager to Pagany, to the Paris of the 20s. He is the poet as passionate defender of the faith that to engage roses becomes a geometry. In other words, Aspidal doesn't fit as a model for the contemporary. And yet I find myself returning to it, um, returning to Aspidal, uh, primarily because of these lines. It is difficult to get the news from poems Yet men die every day for lack of what is found there. And I'll just read you. Um, it's at the end of the first section of Asphodel. God bless you. My heart rouses thinking to bring you news of something that concerns you and concerns many men. Look at what passes for the new. You will not find it there but in despised poems. It is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Hear me out, for I too am concerned, and every man who wants to die at peace in his bed besides. Again, um, Bob Perlman has written about how these lines are a lot more ambivalent than they are usually interpreted. While the lines state the failure of poems to give the news, which is perhaps the new of make it new, or perhaps actual topical news, the lines are often read as a proclamation of poetry's virtues and seem to promise that poetry's social dilemma, the question of its usefulness in the world, can be resolved. I feel like this quote, it is difficult, to get the news from poems is everywhere I look. The visual artist Alfredo Jarre put it on a billboard. 
And I looked up the phrase on Google Books, and I'm just going to read for you um, some of the titles of the 267 books that make use of it. Um, Perlman talks about how it's been used in books about poetry, so I'm just going to list um, titles that are mostly not about poetry and hope that in reading this list, somehow it comes off sounding like a poem. <laughs> but maybe not. So again, this is where that quote, is, it is difficult, um, is, is found on Google Books. What painting is, how to think about oil painting using the language of alchemy, Bioethics, an introduction to the history, methods, and practice. Doctor's stories, the narrative structure of medical knowledge. Reconstructing undergraduate education, using learning science to design effective courses. The Oxford textbook of palliative care for children. On Angel's Eve, on making the most of your final time together. Dead Wrong, a death row lawyer speaks out against capital punishment. Beauty and Photography, Essays in Defense of Traditional Values, Chaucer's Body, The Anxiety of Circulation in the Canterbury Tales, Transactions, Contemporary Latin American and Latino Art, Gertrude Stein and the Essence of What Happens, Doing Psychiatry Wrong, A Critical and Prescriptive Look at a Faltering Profession, Swimming, <laughs> swimming Against the Current, Living for the God You Love, Idealism and Liberal Education, The American Love ly Lyric After Auschwitz and Hiroshima, Last Call, Poems on Alcoholism, Addiction, and Deliverance. Crossroads Modernism, Descent and Emergence in African American Literary Culture. The Poetry of Nursing, Poems and Commentaries of Leading Nurse Poets. Blood and Bone, Poems by Physicians. The Third and Only Way, Reflections on Staying Alive. The Heart Aroused, Poetry and the Preservation of the Soul in Corporate America. Talk, <laughs> Talk, NPR's Susan Stanberg Considers All Things. Art of Engagement, Visual Politics in California and Beyond, The First Resort of Kings, American Cultural Diplomacy, Published and Perished, Something to Declare, Justice and Peace Education, Plotinus on Beauty, Father and Son, My Days of Anger, Planet Medicine, Encyclopedia of World Problems and Human Potential, The Face of Time, The Pinter Ethic, The Erotic Aesthetic, What is a Book, Death of a Writer, Mole's Pity, Can Poetry Matter? On Occasion, The Partisan Voice <laughs> <laughs> Flashback through the heart, a continuous harmony, strong as your hold, a boundless field, so ask, not forgotten, metamorphosis, a homemade world, reading the sphere, listening on all sides, open house, voices to come home to, the art of faith, faith, the universal drum, duh, the stupid history of the human race, paperwork, a snake bird, a secret location on the Lower East Side, earth ships, seeking light in each dark room, unrelenting readers. So it's difficult to get the news from poems, but it's not difficult to use that quote to mean all sorts of things, which is perhaps why it's so difficult to get the news from poems. Uh, but what draws me to this quote and to the second section of Asphodel in particular is the way that the topical news comes into play. In the year Williams started this poem, he was investigated by the FBI because of his connection to Pound. And because of that, he lost his position as poetry consultant for the Library of Congress, also that year, the H-bomb was tested, and about the same time, and I'm getting all this info from an article by Andrew Lawson called History and or the Abyss, um, at the same time, the Rosenbergs were executed, and all of these events are in the poem. Um, and I'll just read another little excerpt. The poem, if it reflects the sea, reflects only its dance upon that profound depth where it seems to triumph. The bomb puts an end to all that. I'm reminded that the bomb also is a flower dedicated, howbeit, to our destruction. The mere picture of the exploding bomb fascinates us so that we cannot wait to prostrate ourselves before it. We do not believe that love can so wreck our lives. The end will come in its time. Meanwhile, we are sick to death of the bomb and its childlike insistence. Um, and so the bomb also is a flower, just as the woman was a leaf. But instead of running the leaves or the woman over with the apparatus of the poem, this flower is dedicated to our own destruction. So I'm interested in this move from the sentimental subject to the structure. 
And I'm interested in how that structure engages with documentary poetics, not just in the collage mode of Patterson, but also in those works that seem more in sync with the tradition of the lyric. Uh, Juliana Spar said in a, in a salon on her work at Mills College that you can listen to at Penn Sound, that the lyric is best at charting how we, how we get close to things, that there are things we need to be more intimate with. She said that the lyric might ask us to have more beloveds, and that in that way we might not go and bomb them or run them over in our car. In other words, the lyric is a tool, a structure that can work against the sentimental subject um, that is at the heart of our complicities. Thank you.